When Lincoln met Euclid, chapter 3, the concept evolves. With the advent of non-Euclidean geometries, our understanding of the nature of mathematics began to change. Just what was mathematics? Was it discovered or, or was it, is it invented or man-made? Is one geometry the geometry of the universe and the other is just convenient and easier to work with approximations of the truth? Is even arithmetic suspect? Recall, however, that the Euclidean approach was still alive and strong. Non-Euclidean geometries were developed through axiomatic reasoning. And as Euclid had shown, this approach was powerful when results were recorded and used for future reasoning. Eventually, a search led by the German mathematician David Hilbert for a solid foundation for all of mathematics was begun. Sparing you the details, that search was somewhat abandoned by the 1930s due to the work of the logician Kurt Gödel. Gödel's incompleteness theorems contributed to a new understanding of proof, of axioms, and of the limitations of reasoning. While these theorems specifically apply to formal symbolic axiomatic systems, the results of these theorems will be important in our invest investigation into the non-mathematical uses of axiomatic reasoning as well. And we will be addressing the consequences of these results and their effects in future chapters. As we look at ex excerpts from Lincoln speeches and articles by Hamilton and Einstein, we should keep in mind the evolution of the word axiom. Hamilton's understanding of axioms will be of the old style, pre-non-Euclidean concept. And although non-Euclidean geometries were being developed in a few math departments of universities in Europe during Lincoln's day, he and most people would not have been aware of them, and so his understanding would be like that of Hamilton's. In other words, to both of these men, axioms were self-evident truths. But by Einstein's time, the concept of axiom had been expanded to include any statement that was assumed to be true or taken to be true to serve as a premise or starting point for further reasoning. A set of axioms could even be used to define abstract objects, for instance, or chosen arbitrarily for the development of an idea or system of thought. The one requirement was that they be consistent with one another. That is, that they not lead to contradictions. Of course, that is not an easy requirement, nor is it one that we can ever be absolutely sure that we have accomplished in any particular discussion or situation. That is an extremely important point to remember. Non-Euclidean geometries were not only established by Einstein's time, they were deemed applicable and even necessary systems of thought for his relativity for his relativity theories. So he certainly had a different understanding and more thorough understanding of axiomatic reasoning than did Hamilton or Lincoln. But all three used their knowledge of Euclid in similar fashion and to great results. Carl Friedrich Gauss, the German mathematician mentioned in chapter one, as the person who prob probably first used the term non-Euclidean geometry, lived a little before Lincoln's time. Or he, he was born maybe 30 to 40 years before Lincoln, so their lives overlapped a little bit. Most math historians, historians consider him to be the greatest mathematician of his time, and he is often ranked as one of the three greatest of all time. He was not the only one who began playing around with using an alternative to Euclid's parallel axiom, which is how non-Euclidean geometries came about. He never published his work on alternative geometries, and there is some evidence in letters to a friend that it was because he was afraid that people would think he was crazy to question the geometry that had existed for over 2,000 years, the one that was self-evident self to all. But once he began to develop a non-Euclidean geometry, he began to question the absolute truth of Euclidean geometry and our ability to truly know the mathematics of space. He considered the mathematics of numbers more knowable than geometry, the mathematics of space. 
In a letter, in, in a letter dated April 9th, 1830, to Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel, Gauss wrote, according to my most sincere conviction, the theory of space has an entirely different place in knowledge from that occupied by pure mathematics, the mathematics of number. There is, there is lacking throughout our knowledge of it the complete persuasion of necessity, also of absolute truth, which is common to the latter. We must add in humility that if number is exclusively the product of our mind, space has a real reality outside our mind, and we cannot completely prescribe its laws. This was taken from Morse Klein's Mathematics, The Loss of Certainty, page 87, bottom of the page. But of course, he got it from an actual letter from Gauss. According to Morris Klein, Gauss was asserting that truth lies in arithmetic and consequently algebra and analysis, calculus and its extensions, which are built on arithmetic because the truths of arithmetic are clear to our minds. But Klein would warn us that even in arithmetic, we must not assert that we have absolute certainty or universal truth. Thus the title of his book, Mathematics, the Loss of Certainty. One reason statements in arithmetic should not be considered any sort of absolute truth about nature is because we have no perfect rules for how to apply them. We have no system built from well-established and accepted axioms for confidently applying our mathematics in all cases. And yet we do seem to have confidence that much, if not most, of our mathematics is indeed applicable and that we often apply it appropriately. Let me state this another way. The mathematics itself is mostly built from well-established and accepted axioms and built, and built using deductive axiomatic reasoning, but the application of it is not. We must rely on additional assumptions that vary according to the situation. Klein gives several examples of this. One that I thought funny is that in arithmetic, we say that 50 plus 60 equals 110, that that is a, tr that that is a truth. But when you add a quart of 50 degree water to a quart of 60 degree water, you don't get 110 degree water. So for this application, 50 plus 60 does not equal 110. But obviously we feel the need to accept our arithmetic fact, 50 plus 60 equals 110, or even something like two plus three equals five. And we understand that it is often applicable. So these are truths within our universally accepted arithmetic. But when applying the truths of, a, of mathematics, no matter whether it is simple arithmetic or advanced calculus, we don't have as universally accepted truths that keep us from going astray. We don't have universally accepted truths that keep us from going astray. We don't have a set of perfect axioms for application of mathematics. In his book, Mathematics, the Loss of Certainty, Klein writes, this confidence that truths would be discovered in all fields was shattered by the recognition that there is no truth in mathematics. The, hopes, the hope and perhaps even the belief that truths can be obtained in politics, ethics, religion, economics, and many other fields may still persist in human minds, but the best support for the hope has been lost. Mathematics offered to the world proof that man can acquire truths and then destroyed the proof. Ironically, it was non-Euclidean geometry and quaternions, both triumphs of reason and axiomatic development that paved the way for this intellectual disaster. Quaternions is a four-dimensional number system, basically. My words now, that, that was Klein's words there. When Klein says, shattered by the recognition that there is no truth in mathematics, I think that the wording is perhaps misleading, or possibly I don't understand what he is saying. To say there is no truth in mathematics is, to me, a meaningless statement. The theorems of each type of geometry or each mathematical system which is developed axiomatically are considered 
truths within the particular system. A theorem in Euclidean geometry is a truth in Euclidean geometry. A theorem in elliptical geometry, which is a non-Euclidean geometry, is a truth in elliptical geometry. The question is, do they tell us the truth about the world? Do these ge geometries describe accurately or do they apply accurately to the real world? Because they do at times contradict each other. Of this, we cannot be absolutely certain. We can often feel relatively certain, however. In mathematics, a statement's truth value is not determined by its applicability. Applicability. <laughs> Einstein says, quote, As far as the propositions of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. End quote. So this is back to me. Mathematics textbooks are full of theorems and definitions and rules that are all abstract and make no reference to the physical world at all. Calculus books have rules for integration and differentiation, all of which are theorems that have been proven, and I mean hundreds of them. There are definitions of things like limits and derivatives and integrals. They all fit amazingly together and seem to never contradict one another. They are truths because we force them to be truths based on our own definitions. In totality, they are like an amazing work of art, but never in the wording or in the equations that are written in symbols is there any reference to anything in the real world. And yet we apply them to the physical world with great success. This is what Einstein's statement means to me when he says, as far as they are certain, they don't refer to reality. He does not mean they don't apply to reality. He simply means that in these pure mathematical statements written in the language of mathematics, no reference to the real world is given. A simple algebraic statement like A plus B equals B plus A is simply a statement about numbers which have no physical existence. In his book, Relativity, the, general and Sp the Special and General Theory, Einstein has this to say. Einstein's words here. In your school days, most of you who read this book made acquaintance with the noble building of Euclid's geometry. That was likely true when Einstein wrote this, but probably not true now. So let me reread this. In your school days, most of you who read this book made acquaintance with the noble building of Euclid's geometry, and you remember, perhaps with more respect than love, the, magnif the magnificent structure on the lofty staircase of which you were chased about for uncounted hours by conscientious teachers. By reason of your past experience, you would certainly disre... By reason of your past experience, you would certainly regard everyone with disdain who should pronounce even the most out-of-the-way proposition of this science to be untrue. But perhaps this feeling of proud certainty would leave you immediately if someone were to ask you, what then do you mean by the assertion that these propositions are true? Let us proceed to give this question a little consideration. Geometry sets out from certain conceptions such as plane, point, and straight line with which we, were, we are able to associate more or less definite ideas. And from certain simple propositions or axioms which in virtue of these ideas we are inclined to accept as true. Then on the basis of a logical process, axiomatic reasoning, the justification, justification of which we feel ourselves compelled to admit, my words here, he refers here to Euclid's convincing demonstrations, as, as Lincoln would, put, would call them. All remaining propositions are shown to follow from those axioms, that is, they are proven. A proposition is then correct, true, when it has been derived in the recognized manner from the axioms. The question of the truth of the individual geometric 
geometrical propositions is thus reduced to the one of the truth of the axioms. Now it has long been known that the last question is not only unanswerable by the methods of geometry, but that it is in itself entirely without meaning. We cannot ask whether it is true that only one straight line goes through two points. We can only say that Euclidean geometry deals with things called straight lines, to each of which is ascribed the property of being uniquely determined by two points situated on it. The concept true does not tally with the assertions of pure geometry, because by the word true, we are eventually in the habit of designating always the correspondence with a real object. Geometry, however, is not concerned with the relation of the ideas involved in it to objects of experience. Let me say that again. Geometry, however, is not concerned with the relation of the ideas involved in it to objects of experience, but only with the logical logical connection of these ideas among themselves. My words. Essentially, Einstein is saying the same thing that his previous quote says. Within the geometry, the truths are truths. When applying the geometry to real objects, truth is no longer a word that applies. He goes on to give an example of how to invent an axiom outside of the realm of pure geometry that refers to something real or physical. He then says, back to Einstein, geometry which has been supplemented in this way is then to be treated as a branch of physics. We can now legitimately ask as to the truth of geometrical propositions interpreted in this way, since we are justified in asking whether these propositions are satisfied for those real things we have associated with the geometrical ideas. My words, Einstein makes the distinction between math and science. Math is pure abstraction with no reference to the physical world, whereas science attempts to explain the physical world. In the next chapter, we will look at more words of Einstein and see that he believes in applying the axiomatic technique outside the disciplines of both math and science and in the realm of ethics. So back to Morris Klein's statement. I am not sure what he means when he says, this confidence that truths would be discovered in all mathematics was shattered by the recognition that there is no truth in mathematics. But I think he is speaking for what mathemat mathematicians felt when it was discovered that apparently self-consistent alternative alternative geometries could be developed that were in opposition to the previously believed true Euclidean geometry. I think he is stating that there is no certainty in mathematics, which I think is different from saying there is no truth in mathematics, particularly as it relates to the real world. After all, that's the name of his book, Mathematics, The Loss of Certainty. Klein goes on to say, with the loss of truth, man lost his intellectual center, his frame of reference, the established authority for all thought. The pride of human reason, mathematics, suffered a fall which brought down with it the house of truth. That's on page 99 of his book, Mathematics, The Loss of Certainty. And then Klein says what I believe is the most important statement in his book. The lesson of history is that our firmest convictions are not to be asserted dogmatically. In fact, they should be most suspect. They mark not our conquests, but our limitations and our bounds. My words now. Let me add that this is early in the chronologically ordered book. Later in his book, Klein spends considerable time and effort to explain the value of mathematics and mathematical reasoning, despite its fall from being believed to deliver absolute truth to humans. And for me, it is this. If we can't be dogmatic about mathematics, the subject that we as humans find the most universal agreement, 
then we shouldn't be dogmatic in our other convictions. However, in this book, I strongly endorse the study of axiomatic reasoning. And while I am a passionate advocate for making a study of axiomatic reasoning part of general education, that is, part of everyone's education, it is not because I believe it will lead us all to infallible reasoning and agreement. In fact, I believe one of the reasons we should study it is to understand the limits of our reasoning processes. That is, that even when done carefully, it never leads to absolute certainty. And yet, when done carefully, it is still the best way to be relatively certain. And I have come to the conclusion, though I won't state it dogmatically, that it may be the way we think naturally, but that we typically do it informally and too hastily with much room for error. End of chapter three.